Hi, everybody. Uh, nice to, to see you or to be seen by you, I guess. Uh, welcome to tonight's discussion of smoke signals. Uh, I am joined, of course, by Jennifer Flieger of Ursinus College, who is enjoying a beverage. And um, as, as I am wont to do during these, so no shame there. Um, I trust most of you watched her wonderful uh, introduction to this film to, that helped really give it some, some great context and points of comparison. Um, a bit about how this works in case you're new with us. Uh, please keep your audio on mute uh, unless you are asking a question or making a comment. You will know it is your turn to ask a question or make a comment because I will call on you. How will I know to call on you, you might ask? You can raise your Zoom hand using the raise hand function within Zoom, as you can see on the diagram I, uh, and slide my colleague Heather made. Um, and uh, at that point, I will I'll call people in order they, their hands were raised, so to speak. And uh, then you can make your comment or ask your question and then please remute yourself. Uh, and Jennifer will share her wisdom and I will make wisecracks. Um, and if you are, uh, we would love for you to introduce yourself to the group in the chat window, um, particularly if you are not from the greater Philadelphia area. Um, we've had people um, join us from uh, certainly other states, other time zones, and even other countries. And so if you're from outside our immediate area, we'd really especially like to know where you're from, but everybody should go ahead and introduce and chat amongst themselves using the chat function. And with that, uh, I think we are ready to go. So I see it with absolute um, sort of uh, consistency of almost old faithful we have David, who has our first question or comment of the evening. David, what's going on? Well, I didn't realize that what I was listening to from you was wisecracks. I've always viewed it as part of the wisdom. But well, thank I'll, you. I'll, I'll take I'll take both. Okay. Uh, th there wasn't a tremendous amount in the in the music this week, but at the same time, I I was sort of intrigued as to whether this uh, uh, musical writer. Had, had done anything else of substance. I didn't really uh, get a chance to do a lot of research, but it seemed like he might be a, uh, a sort of a, a one star uh, a pony for that. And I also wanted to give Jennifer a, a chance to sort of deep, deep in uh, to, to the relationship side, because I, I started out thinking I was going to be watching a movie primarily about Native Americans and certain of the issues that they were facing. And the more I watched, the more I felt that it was on two or three different levels. It was any two guys growing up at some level and, and the banter. And, and in some level, it was sort of an all world uh, kind of issue. And uh, I like the way Jennifer helps me think these things through. So I'll toss it to her with, uh, with that opening. And thank you for, uh, for giving us something that I at least viewed as uh, a different genre and something I hadn't gotten a chance to see before. Well, uh, you're welcome. Uh, I agree. It was a, a great suggestion by Jennifer. I hadn't seen the film since it had first come out. Um, so I was glad to have the occasion to revisit it. Um, and uh, I happen to agree that, and I think it's one of the strengths of the film, that there are elements of it that in a way could be about just any two friends who grew up together. Um, but I, I, and I think they sort of, the film weaves in in an intelligent um, and almost sort of naturalistic way, some of the sort of larger issues. Um, but Jennifer, what, what are your thoughts on that, the sort of relationship perspective on the film? Yeah, I'm glad that you liked it so much and that you see these things in it because this is why I was saying in the introduction that it has this element of just general American independent cinema feel of the 90s. Because it's true that it's about growing up and it's a coming of age story. And Alexi is pretty good at writing those kind of stories. If you ever read Diary of a Part-Time Indian, it works like that too. Like any kid who's felt out of place or been the poor kid in a rich school or been put upon can identify with the character in that film. Just like anybody growing up can identify with the weird friendship that these two have and the kind of roles that they take. So I think that's absolutely true. Um, and it's it's quite a nice it's quite nice to see their relationship develop in in relation to that father figure that they both hold in such different kinds of esteem. 
And as for the music, the thing that I think is really interesting about the music, I did one of those things in that intro where I said, I have two things to say. And then I said one thing, because as I'm talking, I sometimes forget. But the other thing I was going to say in that intro is that a lot of these songs are sung by Jim Boyd, who was a Native American singer who had a band or a couple of bands on his own. And he's singing lyrics that Alexi wrote. So an example of that would be the song John Wayne's Teeth was something that Sherman Alexi made up for the movie. And I think that scene just works absolutely splendidly. Like they don't um, fight with the bigoted guys on the bus. Instead, we see the bus drive away and we hear this John Wayne's Teeth song in a kind of traditional fashion performed as a rebuke of that racism, but it doesn't confront it in a way that makes the viewer uncomfortable. Instead, we get to laugh about it, which in a sense is part of the way the film nods to white people. Like you get a sense that this is a film for festival audiences and whatnot, but it's still a, a great use of music to make a commentary like that, so. The thing I, the, one of the things I think is so smart about the film is that there are this sort of universal elements of, you know, the ways in which the two boys, when they're boys, the two, the two men, when they're boys, um, have their tensions and their friction and they each have sort of challenges at home. And the thing I kind of, the thing that I think is really smart about the film is that while those challenges or those frictions are sort of almost universal or are universal, at least in an American context, sort of the causes behind those are, you know, in some ways, at least partially or implicitly specific to this particular culture that were many of us are being introduced to and in watching the film. I mean, um, uh, 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 Victor's dad is, you know, is abusive. And that's one of his flaws, although he has other, he has other qualities. So he's a rounded character in that regard. But you, you can't help but sort of the film sort of implies that there are elements of the sort of historical treatment of Native Americans, that is part of the reason why he has the personality and behaviors that he does. And so that's, it's a universal circumstance the boy is in. But it's not necessarily so universal. The causes, the root causes of it aren't necessarily so universal. And I think that's a very interesting way to approach this sort of dynamic. Um, let's see, uh, Robert, you have a question or comment. Yes, thanks. Uh, one of the things that struck, struck me is that this was sort of a kind of a road trip, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. um, I, I felt like that was part of the genre here. Uh, a, a road trip between two buddies and how they cause cha fundamental change in their lives. Um, I was wondering if, you, if, if both of you would compare this to Dances with the Wolves. Dances Dance of the Wolves? I can't even remember now. Dances with Wolves? Do, which one do you think is a better picture and why? Um, I'll, I'll go first um, so I can get the angry letters if there are going to be any. Um, I, don't, uh, I don't personally hold uh, Dances with the Wolves in, um, in very much high, in, in very much regard uh, as a movie or as an alleged Western. Um, I think that uh, as Jen Jennifer and I talked about this a bit because we knew this question was going to come up. And um, I think that, you know, it is a particular brand of sort of white American liberal attempting to revise previous Westerns, but still limited in its own efforts to do that by nature of the limitations of the creators and the society and the industry it was being made in. Um, I, you know, I, I, I find it to be an indulgent film and I find it to be sort of personally indulgent and I find it to also be not nearly as much about, or not nearly as um, uh, revealing about or as much of a story about or depicting Native American culture as some people thought. I don't know if the film ever necessarily directly claimed to be that itself, but it certainly was kind of marketed that way to, to certain audiences. I think this, the movie this week 
is indisputably, you know, made by Native Americans about some Native Americans and their experiences. Um, and, you know, one's contemporary, one's set in the past. I mean, I don't think they're really trying to do the same thing or, or be the same type of movie. So I don't necessarily say, you know, I have trouble saying one's better than the other when they're not really even playing the same game. It really is sort of an apples and oranges scenario. What I will say though, is if only one of these two movies could be on the national registry, um, I would pick the film that we watched to discuss tonight rather than the other. Uh, Jennifer. Um, first of all, the best Kevin Costner movie is Field of Dreams because Iowa is heaven and I love it deeply. But anyway, um, I think Dances with Wolves, I agree with Andrew that there's still like a centering of the white male gaze in that film, you know, a white man awakening to a kind of culture. And what's so great about Smoke Signals, in my opinion, is that they don't care about what the, showing a white man's awakening to anything at all. The only white guy I can remember in the movie, I think, is the sheriff near the end. And he already seems pretty aware that, you know, some other white guys are drunks and are willing to, you know, sell somebody out for a crime. Um, so I think what's cool about Smoke Signals in terms of your comment about the road trip movie, though, is along those same lines. If you think of some road trip movies that we know, like Easy Rider or like the end of Midnight Cowboy, where they go on the bus down to the south or something like that. Um, what we're seeing is that the notion in those movies that white guys have control of the country, they can tour the country, they can look at things and take in new experiences. And here the two uh, young men in the beginning of the movie refer to America as a different country. Someone asked them if they have their passports when they're ready to go out into the United States, you know, somewhere other than the reservation. So I think we see a different way of looking at America and thinking about who has the right to um, traverse its space. And they give us that that different kind of view without considering how a white guy would look at that same space. Yeah, I mean, I think I think I think it's very um, smart and very uh, in terms of an observation by viewers, and it's intentional by the filmmakers to you know think of this film as a road movie. Um, and I think that sort of building on what what Jennifer was saying that you know, road movies have sort of, you know, not always, but implicit in many of them, there is, there's a sense of freedom, mm -hmm. right? Either freedom to go on the journey, or you're taking this journey sort of reluctantly, but it's to gain freedom, or you think you will be freer if you get to wherever it is you're trying to go, et cetera, et cetera. That's something that isn't, a, isn't an initial or explicit kind of element of this road trip, right? It's something that's, I mean, I think that um, uh, um, the, uh, I'm drawing a blank, not Victor, but- Thomas? Thomas, I think Thomas sees this as an adventure, but I also, but I, I think Victor does it, Victor sees it as a chore. And I don't think they, spend most any of the journey there or most of the journey back thinking they will find freedom or feeling a sense of freedom. And I think that that's, I think one, that's an interesting dynamic for a road movie. And two, it's an interesting dynamic to think about in relationship to the fact of what Jennifer was saying about these are, you know, these are Americans, but they're sort of, you know, entering a foreign land as in, you know, when they, go into these other places in their own country. So, or what, what could be and should be seen as their own country. So um, it's an interesting dynamic. You don't often see in road movies, I think. I think that a comment about freedom is fantastic because if you think about it, they find freedom in relation to themselves with their own past and their own life as they return to it at the end. But the, the sort of makeover that Thomas goes through doesn't stick. He goes back at the end and braids his hair once again, right? And then at the very end of the film, we see them throwing the ashes near the reserve where they already live. So it's not like they've gone out into the world and become new people. It's just that they've dealt with the past and their own identity and then now can return to the same place. Yeah, with a, with a, a, a new freedom, you know, sort of relieved of some of the burdens they were feeling previously. Yeah. Let's see, um, Terry, do you have a question or comment? I do not. Yeah, I do. 
Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. That's the, okay. Uh, <laughs> I'm I'm an enrolled member of the Stockbridge Muncie Band of Mohican Indians. And I will tell you, this is a very popular movie with Indian people. It, it rings true, um, the sense of humor in particular. Um, I want to comment on the road movie part of this. The, uh, I was holding, when I first time I saw this, I was holding my breath the entire time they were out on the road because every encounter with white people off the res is fraught. Mm -hmm. uh, the CDC statistics show that Yes, black people are killed by police at a much higher rate than white people, but in fact, American Indians are killed at a higher rate per capita than even black people. So the, when they were taken into the sheriff's office, I was holding my breath the entire time. I thought this is gonna be a disaster. Or when the drunk guy who caused the wreck accuses them, I thought he's gonna be believed. Mm -hmm. So um, it's, it's interesting to me that the, the, this film was, marketed as, as a comedy. And it is it does have its very funny moments. And the Indian the, the sort of wry Indian sense of humor, mocking self-deprecatory sense of humor is very accurate. But also it's uh, in the end, it's not a comedy. Because of the truth of what lies behind all of the encounters and what could have happened? Yes, exactly. And of course, then of course, the story of, of Victor and his relationship with his yeah. father and coming to terms with his father is, is a serious topic too. But uh, it, it, once they were out in the white world, it was getting pretty hard to, to find it funny. Well, thank you for those uh, comments, Terry, and for sharing your uh, perspective and, uh, and the knowledge. Um, I think that, you know, for better or for worse, um, often for worse, but in one way, I think for better, you know, the market marketing is detached from the content of the film. It's just like, you know, people who write articles and columns for newspapers don't make their headlines. And any, any journalist will tell you that they've gotten a lot of bad mail because of a headline that, that they didn't think reflected their article. And I'm, I'm sure that if you ask filmmakers about how their films were marketed, um, you know, they would have similar complaints probably quite often. The one thing I will say, though, in, in defense of that strategy, and it's a business strategy. I mean, you know, it's trying to make it's trying to make something serious seem lighter um, and trying to make something that has the potential to, you know, be ignored by segments of the audience who don't want to experience something they haven't seen before or potentially have some of their views challenged, you know, it's trying to appeal to them. The one thing I will say though is, you know, did it get people to see the movie who might not have seen it otherwise? And I, I'm, I'm the sort of person who, who feels like if, if a movie can open people's eyes to something, let's try to get as many people to see it as possible. Um, mm -hmm. Not to the point of sort of being false about it, but if their take, if their emphasis of, on the humor got anybody to see this movie who thought they weren't interested in a movie about and by Native Americans, then I would consider that a, a plus. But obviously, I would also say there's a lot of comedies that deal with serious matters. And whether something's a comedy or a drama is can be subjective, but I don't think it's really a close call with this one. I think there are some very funny moments, um, probably more than some of us even realized, but um, overall, it's, it's a movie about serious things. I, I, would, I would agree that it's good to get people to see it, that we run into this problem, it Dances with Wolves was mentioned earlier. Many movies that are purportedly about Indians have to have a white hero at the center who saves the day, just as movies about aliens have to have an earthling. But, uh, so I agree that anything that got people to watch this is good, at, because this is a movie that is is produced by, acted by actual Indians in the movie and about Indians. So that's a great thing. Yeah. Uh, Jennifer, think, did you have any thoughts? Yeah, I have always felt too that the seriousness of the father's abuse um, of the mother and the son has not, there's something about the movie, the way that it ends that still feels to me like we haven't treated that with the seriousness that it deserves. Um, so I'm, 
I hear absolutely what you're saying too about the, the relationship of these folks to the rest of the world, but that particular issue, and I kind of mentioned this in the intro to a degree, has, I don't, I don't want to forgive him quite that easily, I guess, as the way the movie kind of wants to in, in the end of the film. So. Yeah, I, I would agree. Uh, they, they hint at some of the causes, the, the basketball game against the priests. Mm -hmm. um, it's hard to get at root causes of what makes people abusive. Um, in, in my tribe, until recently, they've died now, but there were people who were missing fingers from being sent to the Catholic schools that were trying to turn them into white people. And every time they spoke their own language, they cut a finger off. So there's a lot of underlying issues here. I don't forgive him either, but there are reasons that people drink too much and become abusive. And it's not universal. I, I won't, don't want people to think that that, that is typical of every Indian family, but uh, it's, I agree with you, it's hard to uh, accept his abusing his wife and his child. Chris Iyer also, I don't know if you've seen his movie that came after this, Skins. I think it deals with some of those issues of alcoholism and abuse in a more serious way that um, it still forgives the brother for his behavior, but it, I don't know. I, I feel like that treatment might be more aligning with what you're saying. Well, thanks very much uh, for for checking in, Terry, and sharing your uh, perspectives yeah. and, and knowledge. We appreciate it. Well, thank you. Take care. Uh, let's see. Uh, uh, Roseanne and Lex, you have a question or comment? Um, yeah, um, I wanted to talk about the road trip. Um, for me, um, they did uh, try to gain freedom during this road trip, especially for Victor. You know, Victor, I'm sure as a kid, he felt like his father left him, that he had done something wrong. Um, and I'm guessing here, because that's the usual feeling of kids when a parent leaves. And Thomas has a totally different view of Victor's father as this good person who not only saved his life, but you know, was there for him at various other times, you know, took him to dinner, whatever. And Thomas tells the stories about this, which Victor does really, really doesn't want to hear. So for me, um, Victor, although he may not have planned it, um, the freedom he gets from this road trip is the forgiveness of his father. You know, that th this person, Susan Song, I guess her name was, she tells him enough about his father, but, you know, to make him later think twice, you know, maybe he was better than I thought. And the most important thing that she tells Victor about his father is that his father elevated him, you know, to this great basketball player, you know, who was the end all and, you know, the be all and the end all. And, that he was really proud of him, essentially. So although Victor may not have bought all of that, you know, when he's picking up the truck, between that and Thomas's storytelling, which I liked because Thomas is the storyteller, which is common in families, but especially in Indian culture. Um, between that and Thomas's stories, you know, he gets a different view of his father and there, thereby releases him from being stuck in this place where he's stuck. And Thomas alludes to it. You know, he says, you know, you don't do anything. Clearly, Victor is stuck in, in a place because he can't move on from, you know, the abuse and the alcoholism and his father leaving. And, and he doesn't repeat it either. He says to the sheriff, he's never had a drink not once in his life. So right. he's determined not to repeat this stuff. Anyway, there, uh, I'm rambling. There are some of my thoughts. Well, thank you, Roseanne. I, I, I think that, the, you know, I think you're right. I think in the end, he does experience a freedom as a result of things he experiences on the trip. I think the difference is he really doesn't have any sense of that freedom until he's already returned in a way. Um, or until he's very close to having returned from the trip, which I think is a bit unusual. The other thing I would say that I, 
I don't know if the film that the film, I don't even know if it addresses implicitly is of course the difference between Thomas and Victor, you know, Thomas has this view of Victor's dad that Victor finds that Victor isn't familiar with and doesn't share and finds upsetting and frustrating, but two things that, that, that Victor doesn't seem to sort of keep in mind is one that, that Thomas feels like he owes his life to Victor's father. And the other is that though his Victor's home life was obviously, you know, very troubled, at least he had his parents um, for both parents for part of his childhood, which is something that Thomas didn't have. And I think Thomas is too, it's not in his personality to sort of throw that at him, but I think that's implicit in the part of their, you know, their conflict. Uh, Jennifer. I think this is one of the most interesting questions about the movie to me is that that freedom that he finds it doesn't come from looking at something new. It comes from reframing something old, but he's reframing the past in, in a lie in a way, right? He didn't win the basketball game. A lot of the things that Thomas tells him about his father didn't happen. Um, and so, and then he finds out the real truth about his father burning down the house. And that's really awful, right? So he's, he's rethinking about the past in a different kind of way. And so for me, the question of the film is when do we want to believe in stories and why do we sometimes need to believe in lies or what kind of mythologies do we need to tell ourselves about our own history to allow ourselves to move forward maybe none of you ever do that but i take those same kinds of pleasures in similar kinds of stories about my past all the time that i'm pretty sure aren't true but like help my identity so that i feel strong enough to move forward to the next day and i think that's if it's if we call it freedom or you know, strength, or I don't know what, that's what Victor gained from, from those stories is an investment in, in his past and his community so that he can carry on. Barbara Casper, you have a question or comment. Okay, uh, Lillian, you have a question or comment. Okay, I'll, I'll keep going down the list. Uh, Janice, do you have a question or comment? I do. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> another aspect of the movie that I'd like to discuss is how it affected me as a Caucasian person. My only uh, exposure to reservation were driving through on trips out west. And it was really dismal, whatever I saw. And here was this movie that the scenery was absolutely gorgeous. And even though it was out West and most of out West was beautiful going through the reservation, at least wherever I happened to have been was definitely not beautiful. This was very beautiful scenery. And in spite of the fact that that may have been in trailers or not, um, you know, up, upscale homes, you, you got the warmth of the family life. They may have been not traditional uh, family structures, which is very common nowadays anyway, as far as who was living together, but there was a great deal of warmth and caring. So there was a, a, a positive social gain that I got by seeing this, uh, in addition to all of the other things that were discussed that uh, it gave me a perspective about uh, indigenous Americans, you know, that, uh, that was not quite as bad as what, what I had had in my, what I thought about it before. Well, the, I mean, the, the to my mind, the key to representations of, of improving representations of, of, cultures and, and segments of society that aren't typically represented, aren't frequently represented, is to have more of them. And the more of them you have, the fuller a picture, you know, one is able to get. And now this is, you know, we've, for, for many of us, um, this is the, you know, sort of um, 
self-authored, at least largely self-authored story, um, film story about Native Americans that we've seen. And, um, you know, that's that's a big step, but, you know, m- more would be better to to be able to round out that that picture to give a even to hope to give a scintilla of the representation that that some other groups get and then to see the range that we know exist in those other more often depicted segments of society um but that being said i mean this is one of the this is one of the great things about movies and this is one of the reasons you know a, a century ago more than a century ago they first took off which was it is a way to bring people places they haven't been and show them show them things they haven't seen and very often particularly 100 years ago and more that was done in a very um narrow-minded or bigoted or limited or dishonest way. Um, The great thing about the changes in technology that have developed, the great thing about the explosion of outlets for media is that there can be more such offerings that are more um, authentic and, um, and, you know, maybe for some of us, this will be the first step towards a, a larger exploration of those things. Um, okay, uh, let's see. Um, uh, Lillian, do you have a question or comment? Yeah, sorry, I, I didn't unmute myself the first time. That's okay. Uh, um, you know, the, the father, um, I mean, the father set the house on fire He ran in, he saved his family, and then he caught Thomas. He cut off his hair. He was never the same after that. I mean, I'm not sure, would he have run away if he wasn't guilt-ridden about that? I I think that was what really sent him on his way. I know he was a drinker, but... um, I, I think I think all of that just caught up with him, and that's what sent him packing when he when he did run off. And I mean, the, the way he hugged that child when he stopped to take him off the truck and gave him back to his mother, I, I don't know that he wanted to leave his child. I think he was just a mess after what had happened. And uh, how you know. I, I, you know, I don't think Victor knew until he met the woman in Arizona what had happened or that his father had saved him. Um, I, I just thought this was such a really beautiful movie about relationships, whatever the people were in this movie. It doesn't matter whether they were Indians or white people or purple people. It was, it was a really... It was a really beautiful story about relationships and, um, you know, how, how people come to terms with each other in the end. You know, I, I thought there was some hope for that. But the other thing is, I have also driven through reservations in the West and they are sad places. I'm not sure that I saw this reservation as a particularly different or happy place. I mean, the West is beautiful, Um, but what do people do? Thomas says to Victor at one point, you've been hanging around here for 10 years. What opportunities do these people have on the reservation when they grow up? I wasn't sure what Victor did. I wasn't sure what the boys could do. Do, do, Can people earn money? It just seemed like such a you know, life seemed like such a dead end on the reservation. Well, um, th- thanks for those comments, Lillian. I, um, to, to go back to your, the first part of what you were talking about, I, I think that, you know, we don't have an explicit single reason why the father leaves. I think we can imagine it is a combination of tensions and pressures. Um, and one might even... You know, it's it's interesting. I I'd seen this movie before, not in many years, but I was surprised with that hug he gave his son when he took him off the truck. Um, and so, on some level, you know, that made me think that part of the reason he was leaving is he knew it wasn't good for him 
good for the boy that there were that there was a downside to him being there for the boy as well um such as when you know when he punched him for spilling a beer i mean he thought that was you know he had some sense that that was wrong but he also couldn't stop his stop himself from doing that at least not reliably um jennifer uh, what are your thoughts i think that um those are all good comments I would just want to comment on the idea that it doesn't matter who they are, because I think it does. I think that the, the relationship story allows us to engage with the movie in a way because we all have relationships and we all have relationships with our fathers or with our children or with our friends. And so that helps. But for so long, Native Americans and First Nation peoples in the cinema and in literature have been treated as non-people, that it matters that we can see them as fully human and people who have exactly the same kind of concerns that we do. So I think it, it matters very much who they are and where they belong and who we see them as. I'm reading with my son right now, The Little House on the Prairie books. And I was reminded that there's a passage in The Little House on the Prairie where when Pa wants to go out West, he says, there aren't any people there well, there's Indians or something like that. And so it's, he doesn't even consider them to be human. And so for so long, this is how we've seen um, this group of people. So part of the humanizing of the community, I think is the goal of the movie. And I think that's why the reservation looks better than we imagine reservations to be or better than we've pictured them in the past. And for me, that the picturing of the reservation is a little bit, that's why I compared it to do the right thing. Nobody in the end of the 1980s imagined bed Stuy as a beautiful neighborhood with gorgeous red walls and beautiful murals. And um, Spike Lee made it look like a really nice block that we're looking at there. Not because he wanted to be realistic necessarily, but because people who live there are human and they're part of a community living together in this place. And if, it's, if it looks more attractive to us or if it looks beautiful to us, it allows us to more fully engage with the characters, I think, so. Well, and it, it's and it's also a way of giving a, a bold or visible visual representation of some aspects that, if there are if they're not universal, exist in all cultures, such as pride in your own community and pride in your home, whether it is a trailer or a mansion, and pride in the specific, the things that make your place, the place you live or the place you're from, you know, unique. And that in both movies make an effort to, both movies you just mentioned, make an effort to convey that, you know, vibrantly and visually, which is what a movie should do. Uh, let's see, Barbara Casper, are you there? Okay, then we will go to uh, Judith White. Do you have a question or comment, Judith? Wow, I'm not having a lot of luck today. <laughs> uh, Ken, I know you're there. Uh, I usually am, thanks. Yes. <laughs> um, I, I found the movie, I, I guess I used the term a little choppy. Things kept, uh, it didn't always have a smooth flow to it. Um, the one thing that bothered me the most, I think, was that relationship with uh, Susan or Susie Song, who was uh, so nice to them, so welcoming, so warm to them, uh, filled with information about uh, his father. And he was ready to leave there after five minutes. He didn't, it's as if he didn't want to know. And it bothered me when, um, Thomas said, well, we got up early in the morning and left without saying goodbye. Uh, I, I just, it, you know, maybe it's not as big a point, but it disturbs me that someone who treated them so well, and that's, that's how they reacted to it. Um, uh, I guess I, I saw very few, um, what's the word, things, very few positive things about the father. He still was a father, and I think in, 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 uh, it crosses all cultural lines that there are people who uh, are not necessarily the best of parents or have a drinking problem, have trouble adjusting to where they're living and decide they need to run away. And uh, they don't always realize how it's going to affect their children. Uh, although this seemed to, it sounded like it was for the best. So uh, I was just a little, I, I would have liked to know more about what happened with Susan and the relationship with the father. 
you know, he kept implying that, did you love him? And she said, well, sure, I loved him, but I loved him as a father. And I would have liked to see more. And yep, go ahead. No, I was, I was just gonna, I was gonna say that, you know, I, I think that um, given how Victor was and how sort of tentatively he was sort of willing to or being forced to learn more about his dad, it doesn't surprise me how cold and distant he was and remained to that character regarding the sort of choppiness of the movie. Um, the, a couple things I would say to that one is it's elements of it were episodic elements of it did have sort of tangents. And I think that there's a couple of things I would um, say sort of in, in defense of that, or as an explanation for that, I guess one is the sort of notion of the kind of seamless, you know, straightforward, um, straight line linear narrative is, I don't even want to say it has to do with race or culture. I think it has to do at the very least with industry, with, um, with Hollywood and other big, big film industries. Um, they're very plot driven and they're very sort of, there's nothing in the movie in most, there's nothing in most movies that you don't need to be there for plot. And this movie is not, is not interested in that. That's not its approach to storytelling. And I don't know nearly, I don't know enough about, um, you know, the the Native American storytelling or the storytelling of the, the, the particular tribe these uh, men were to say that it's more their culture than it is Hollywood's culture. I will simply say that I know Hollywood is the is, has conditioned us to expect a movie to be so straight to the point and to not diverge in any way. And not all storytelling traditions, not all filmmaking traditions share that approach. No, I agree. I didn't mind the, uh, the fact that there was more to it. I just, um, I guess though, I wanted to find out more about things. One of the things that kept bothering me is what is with that car that was only driven backwards? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, um, I, I, I think that perhaps Ken that your interest in automobiles would be better served by a movie like Ford versus Ferrari or something. Um, I think that's just one of those sort of quirks of that, of those two women that we were just supported, so, sort of supposed to say, huh, isn't that interesting? And um, yeah, I, I, I can't offer any insight on that, but thank you very much for your comments, Ken. You really mean that? I do. Okay. I Take care. <laughs> I think if you've ever had or been a stepmother or had or been a step sibling, the relationship to Susie probably makes a lot more sense because it's it's a kind of jealousy and resistance that your father could have rejected you and your family for something else, whatever that thing is and whatever her relationship to his father was. So having been such a figure myself, I instinctively understand why he would be rude to Susie and not ever really warm up to her. But um, I think from her perspective or from a viewer's perspective, looking at this nice woman welcoming these two young men, um, that would be hard to, to watch. Okay, third time's a charm. Judith White, are you there? Uh, yes, I am. Okay. I just figured out how to unmute myself. <laughs> so, Go ahead, please. Um, uh, well, one thing I loved, that car is stuck in reverse. And I just, that's got to be a comment on something. And it's really <laughs> funny. <laughs> you know, like, are they happily moving backwards? They want to poof the white people away. Like, what if, when Columbus came, what if this happened, you know? So I don't know. Maybe they're rewriting history with their reverse gear. Um, but I felt like, uh, two things that Susie tells them are just the most important to uh, Victor. One is that his father saved him. He said, you know, he, he told um, Thomas he was so jealous because, you know, Thomas at least was saved by him and his father hadn't done anything for him. And then Susie tells him, oh, yeah, you know, he's, he saved you. You know, he, he went in there and saved you. Um, and then she also says he never intended to leave. Might be, maybe that's, it might even be the last thing she says, but he never intended to leave you. 
it's like he went away, but he didn't know he wasn't going back, except every day he didn't go back. Mm -hmm. so. I think that's I mean, a great comment. Someone mentioned being stuck earlier that Victor was stuck. And it seems like you're bringing that back to the father too. The father got stuck in a pattern of not going back. And then every day he made a decision not to go back. And he didn't want his story to end the way that it did. We can't always predict how each line of our own stories are going to end. And that wasn't the one that he wanted. That's true. Uh, Diane, you have a question or comment. Uh, yeah, so um, I really did enjoy the movie. I'd never seen it before. I was a little bothered by some of the stereotypes of um, Native Americans, that they drink too much, that um, um, there's family abuse. Uh, and um, But I, I did appreciate uh, Jennifer's comments about storytelling because I thought that was such an important part of, of, uh, of the strength of the movie. And... And Thomas, the storyteller, seemed to have the best sense of himself of any of the characters. And he was the one that was so invested in storytelling. Um, and um, I guess the, the one other thing I want to talk about is, is the hair issue. Um, uh, I was wondering whether there was some connection to the biblical, uh, you know, Sansom who cuts off his hair and loses some strength. But it also seemed like hair was a transition point. The father cuts off his hair to kind of maybe forget about the burning down of the house and and Victor cuts off his hair to uh, turn over a new leaf and maybe start, um, uh, you know, thinking more highly of himself. I, those are my comments. Well, thank you, Diane. Um, I think the, the, the film talks about identifies that um, the cutting off of hair as as a way of showing mourning and uh, or loss and I think the the father does that in the beginning because he realizes, I mean, the, these friends of his have died, but as we retrospectively sort of learn, he was the cause of their death. And then I think Victor does it um, in his father's trailer when he finally, for the first time, starts to feel the sort of, feel the sense of loss of his father being gone. Um, so I, I think that's what that is. Um, Jennifer? Yeah, I, I agree with you. And I think that Terry Shepard has talked about it in the chat too, as a sign of mourning in Indian tradition. So that seems to probably be the why. But also in the trailer, he looks at this picture and it says home on the back. And that's when he can finally, I think, release that, the feelings of loss and mourning. Right, which, which was a, a smart way of conveying, of having the, you know, of the film letting Victor see get proof of what Susie was telling him, which was that, you know, it's not like he was gone forever. He always planned to go back. He just, he didn't get to. Um, uh, Judy Kinderman, you have a question or comment? Uh, <clears throat> let me see. Oh. I, think I think you, you just muted yourself again. Yeah, Ju uh, Judy, you muted yourself again. Um, there you go. Okay. Okay, can you hear me okay? Yes, yes, go ahead, Judy. Okay, uh, great. Well, getting back to the idea of the road, uh, the road trip uh, uh, theme of the movie, I think, um, I think uh, the way to kind of look at it is uh, not so much as a, uh, as a getting a sense of freedom, but, or perhaps maybe more the being able, the sense of discovery that comes and the freedom of discovery and self-discovery. Uh, I thought that uh, the storytelling aspect of the movie was beautiful. Um, I love the stories. And I think that as the movie progresses, Victor becomes uh, a bit more tolerant of the Indian, uh, the lore and the, um, and, the, and the way that Indians do tell stories. And I thought that was a really beautiful aspect of the movie. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I think you're right. I think there's an extent to which all road movies are about some sort of self-discovery um i think th and and i think that happens here i think the the difference is is that um th there's often sort of a, a corollary purpose for it that has some element some brighter element to it than this one did i also think that the self-discovery usually sort of happens earlier 
um, in the trajectory of the trip, although I'm sure that's not always the case. Um, but I, I think that is a, a, a shared element of, of most, if not all, road movies. Uh, Jennifer? I think your point about um, his uh, coming to terms with stories is super important because his rejection of his father seemed to be, at least to me, paired with a, a rejection of the community. And that's why he was stuck and not moving forward. If you remember that scene when his father asked him, Victor, who's your favorite Indian? He keeps saying, nobody, nobody. I mean, his father played the character of nobody in Dead Man as an actor, but also like by saying nobody, you're sort of rejecting this whole ancestry, this whole legacy. And so now finally realizing that the stories, whether they're true or not, is part of his past and part of who he can become and he can move on from there. Um, connected to the father seems to make a lot of sense. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, Hans, you have a question or comment? Um, actually, it, it's Sherry speaking, um, Sherry and Hans. Hi. Um, hi. Um, I loved the movie. I actually, when it first came out, I loved it so much that I dragged some of my friends to go see it while it was still playing in the same theater. Um, and this is, so this is the third time I've seen it. And to me, um, there are a couple of things that really struck me. First of all, the sweetness and um, non-judgmentalness of Tom, Thomas was just so lovely. And I think I saw in it Sherman Alexi um, foreshadowing his own growing up to become a writer and to express the stories and the histories of his people um, so eloquently. I mean, I just, I saw him writing himself into that character. And then the other thing that I found very profound was um, the, the idea of how do we forgive our fathers? Because I saw Victor as someone who had been abused by his father and blamed his father for all his um, problems and shortcomings, the way abused children often do. And the, his stuckness in his life and his unacceptance of so many things around him, about, it, around, about his culture and everything. And I saw that as as he came to terms with that, and then he finally cut his hair to mourn his father, I think that was the first movement that he had of becoming what they call unstuck. And um, the end of the movie is like, how do we forgive our fathers? Because so many of us are sort of stuck in the image we had of our fathers, and it's not really a very complete picture that um, most of us grow up with. Um, and how do we forgive our, do we forgive them for being our fathers? I thought that was really profound. And, um, and do we forgive them for marrying or not marrying our mothers? And then all the other things that people sometimes hold on to resentments, even into adulthood. Um, I thought that this was a really beautiful way to um, express the fact that Victor was finally becoming unstuck and could possibly move on into his own persona as, as an adult person yeah. um, and, and get over the, his childhood, um, the resentment that he more or less lived by yeah, he, um, and blame that he more or less lived by of his father. Yeah, I, I, I think that's a, a really perceptive observation and um, is a great way, to, great way to articulate the development that Victor um, undergoes, or the, I guess the growth is a better way to say it. Um, Jennifer. I think that's beautiful and completely true, and I'm glad that you shared it. I also um, feel that you're right about Thomas and his um, personification of Sherman Alexie as a writer, and I, I feel like I need to say at this moment that I wish Sir Sherman Alexie had turned out to be as good a person as his character Thomas, um, because he did some pretty terrible things um, in his career and his relationship to women that I wish he would uh, atone for in some way. I agree, <laughs> me too. Um, Dana, you have a question or comment. I do, and, and thankfully Jennifer just uh, put me in that place. So I'm gonna take a little <laughs> bit of a swerve off the reservation and ask a question um, about Sherman Alexie. Sherman Alexie specifically and kind of what he did and what he stands for in general. And I think I wanna ask my question in a general way. And this is it. What are we to do as 
lovers of art, moviegoers, um, with people who have behaved inappropriately, who have done some terrible things, and yet have produced great art, or at least good art. I am torn um, so often, and this, and it, I've thought of it again. So thank you, Jennifer, for, for talking about this in your introduction. And I think the way you phrased it was there's enough good about this movie that we can maybe put aside what Sherman Alexi did and appreciate the movie. But I'm, I'm, I'm actually asking an even larger question, which is, um, can we do that? How do we do that? Should we do that? How do we, um, how do we love work done by people who behave badly? Big question, I know, and it's a swerve off of the film, but I, I'm, I'm really curious about what both of you have to say about it and anyone else who's listening, because um, we've all been, we all probably grapple with this question. So thanks. Um, Jennifer, do you wanna go first or? I think with movies, the question is a little bit harder to answer because there's so many contributors. So this movie is not merely a, a work of Sherman Alexi, but of Chris Iyer, the director and everybody who participated in it. So I think I wouldn't, I would continue and I, I did obviously by recommending it to watch this film um, because so it, it's historically very important and so many more people contributed to him than just him. But there are, I'm absolutely sure a lot of other Native American writers you could read books by rather than only Sherman Alexi. So I think sometimes it's who we hold up on a pedestal and if we're going to privilege their work over the work of other people we could read in addition to or instead, then we have issues that we need to deal with ourselves. I mean, we deal with this with two, a couple other figures that come to the top of my head, Woody Allen and John Wayne. Um, I still watch and teach John Wayne movies because they're extremely historically important and because again, John Wayne is not the only person in those movies and not the only contributor to them. And they tell us a lot about masculinity to American culture. And as I'm watching them and thinking about them, I'm not contributing any money to John Wayne because he's dead or to his estate or, or anything like that. So he's not benefiting from my learning something about the world from those films. Whereas with Woody Allen, I have to admit, I never teach Woody Allen. Um, partly because I don't really have that much to say about Woody Allen, but he's so much a part of the films that he makes and his characters are so much a part of himself in those movies that I find myself repulsed by the idea of talking about them and I don't want to. So for me, it's always a, a case by case basis of how much the person who did something bad um, is found in that work and what might I be able to see instead of that thing, maybe something that hasn't been able to find the light because we've been so interested in that person and their prominence. That's what I would say. We just got a question in the chat um, asking what John Wayne did. He was a giant racist. <laughs> okay. I'm like, very vocal about it. <laughs> Okay, um, you know this is a very um, this is a very complicated question. I think Jennifer makes a great point that in a sense, in movies and television shows and things like that, it's um, it, it's despite what auteur theory and 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 branding and marketing would have us believe, they are at the very least they are group efforts. Um, it's actually really funny. Anytime Bill Cosby's name comes up, my wife says. Um, I feel so bad for all the actors who played the Cosby kids because, you know, they were part of this show that was, you know, such an, an emblem of its time before people knew everything about Bill Cosby, but also it, it, I mean, it's their livelihood and the reruns of that show were probably a big portion of some of their livelihoods. And now those are gone because this man did, did these things. And on the one hand, you understand why people don't want to give him any money, but they're also depriving the other people involved in the production. Um, and so I think in that sense, from a sort of a, you know, a commercial sense or an artistic sense, there's certainly that element. Um, the other thing I would say is that, you know, um, what does, how illuminating is the work and is the, the potential to inform or educate or um, expose people to something they haven't seen before, does that, is that worth 
the trade-off or the risk of the trade-off. Um, just, uh, you know, for an example, I, I think probably many of us who are participating in this discussion today um, learned more or at least heard from more Native Americans and learned and observed more Native American aspects of Native American culture by watching this movie than perhaps we have in any other way at any other time. Um, I'm a I'm a Jewish person from New York. I don't need to see Woody Allen movies anymore because I, I got that covered. So, you know, it it makes things, you know, that's a calculus too. Um, and also, do we avoid things that are that have terrible elements to them? And if we do that for long enough and often enough, do we forget about those terrible things in history? This comes up every time someone wants to teach or study the birth of a birth of a nation, which is a movie that, like Jennifer was saying about John Wayne, is an essential element of cinema history and, in that regard, American history but is also a movie that has horrible depictions in it and was made by someone who was so racist he didn't even understand <laughs> how racist he was. Um, so, you know, but if you, for, but if you wipe that movie away, then people are never going to see the, for example, the movie that was a tremendous boost to the growth of the NAACP um at a, at a critical time so you know these are questions ultimately as someone said in the chat you have to ask yourself these questions and do this calculus for yourself um but it, it is unfortunately the more we learn about people um and the more different types of art we have the potential to see this is going to be a question we're all going to be asking ourselves i think a lot a lot more moving forward than we did than we did in the past and and obviously there's good, that's a good thing in many ways, but it also makes things more complicated, but that's, that's the price you pay for having a broader realm of consideration about what you choose to consume. I think also there's a difference between approaching our viewing of a film or reading of a book as a student who's learning something and thinking about big ideas and making a statue or putting up a poster to celebrate something. Those are different moves. So I would probably not put a poster of, I definitely would not put a poster of Birth of the Nation in my house, but I feel I would feel like I would be an incomplete film scholar if I didn't watch and know something about that film. So that you can think of it that way too, I think. Right. Um, Janice, did you have a, another question or comment? No, you did not. Okay, um, I'm gonna give, oh, you- Yes. Do, okay, go ahead. I'm sorry, I, I touched the wrong button. That's all right. Uh, um, I'd like to go back to the rejection of Victor, uh, of Susie by, by Victor, because instead of that being a flaw, I thought it rang very true that I think it's a common thing, or at least I have observed it, that people who can be abusive in families often show a completely different face to other people. And can be known as you know this wonderful fellow and that it's not an uncommon thing. And uh, that, so to me, it rang very true. And he probably felt very resentful when Susie was starting to tell him all these wonderful things about her relationship with his father when he didn't have it. So to me, yeah. it was not a flaw in the movie, but uh, something that was a, a truth in the movie. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Janice. Yeah, um, I, I would agree. And I, I think that that was that we saw that with Thomas as well. And that was probably part of part of Victor's frustration with Thomas and his stories. Absolutely. Um, uh, Giotti, do you have a question or comment? Yeah, I have a question about, um, I like the movie and Jennifer. Um, my question is, um, probably in the beginning, um, I figured uh, when uh, Victor's dad said uh, to Thomas's grandma that I didn't want to do this. And I was wondering, why would he say I didn't want to save this kid? So I figured that it must be some, some, some of his um, reason or accident or something happened that caused 
five. Um, so when at the end when um, Victor was coming back and we when he heard from Suzy that his his dad did cause that accident at that time um, at the end um, when Thomas was starting I thought Victor got mad at him for something and he's gonna spill out what his dad did and that caused um, Thomas's um, parents, um, parents' death, but he didn't do that. So kind of showed the whole movie that how things change. He kind of um, outgrew all his resentment to his dad up to the point that he didn't want to tell his friends that oh, you are ruining this person, that that person killed your parents. I mean that person caused that accident, which died. So is that um, the intentional thing, um, you think, or it was just anyone could have done that um, the, in the normal circumstances, even without, yeah, like how we are showing, showing that he got unstuck. Did he do that because of that? Or he would have, anyone would have done that? Um. Jody, I'm I'm sorry. It was it was a, you sort of came in and out there a little bit. Um, but I I th I think you were referring to the sort of the kind of uh, the the source of the understanding that that Thomas and Victor seem to come to when Victor drops Thomas off at his house, where there's just sort of this interesting exchange between the two of them, where you know it seems like Victor's going to talk about maybe is thinking about talking about what that his father started the fire that killed and and Thomas has this seems to have this understanding about it. Um, Jennifer, do you know the moment I'm talking about? I think so. Yeah. Um, am I, am I remembering it right? Is that, is that, was that your take on it as well? In that moment, I don't did, did Victor tell Thomas that his father was responsible for the fire? We don't, we don't see I him don't, do it. We yeah. don't see him do it. No, I don't think he did it. Yeah. Uh, so what my question is whether it was intentional that um, Victor got like so matured at that point after coming back from the trip that he didn't do that. Otherwise, when the trip started, he he would have just come, come to Thomas and said anything to him without thinking about twice that what could happen to Thomas if he says that. I think that's a great point. Like this is the character development. You're absolutely right. At the beginning of the film, I totally agree. He was mad at Thomas. He didn't want Thomas to have a relationship with his own father and he would have told him if he had known that fact. And at the end, he kept it to himself. And that shows that he he's willing to be initiated into the world of stories enough to keep some vital piece of information to himself. I think that's what you're suggesting. And if that, if that is, I agree with you totally. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Um, Linda, you have a question or comment. Okay, I guess we will end it there. Um, thanks very much everybody for tuning in. Um, we have um, a seminar coming up tomorrow night on The Wire. There are still a few spots left. Uh, we have Jennifer teaching a seminar on the uh, trailblazing filmmaker Dorothy Arzner um, from uh, early in Hollywood history. Uh, and then in between on the 29th, we have uh, one, another one of our short, uh, our seminars focused on short movies. Um, and then I am teaching something at the end of October on post-World War II political films. Um, we will have more coming up uh, as the um, fall sort of gets underway uh, officially. And of course we will be back on future Monday nights, um, most of them anyway. And uh, we look forward to seeing you. Um, we have a lot going on on our website. We have new films you can screen in the Theater 5 section. We have all of our education offerings available in film studies online, including the mini lessons found in the Ask Andrew segments. And um, we really appreciate your attention and engagement with us. And if you feel like you've gotten a lot out of our film studies online programs, please consider making a donation to the Film Institute uh, to help us uh, keep being able to make these offer, uh, 
make have these programs, excuse me, and to help us hit the ground running when we are able to reopen safely and with good movies to show you. Uh, until then, Jennifer, thank you so much for joining us. Bye, thank you. And thank you all for joining us. Take care. We'll see you next Thanks. time. Thanks thank a lot. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.